Sorry. Hey, thank you for your patience. Thanks for sticking around. So let me jump right into it. So my talk today is uh, about robotics and spine surgery and how uh, this, I really believe, is a technology that is going to uh, kind of be a paradigm shift and how it's going to truly affect all of our careers in the next 10 years or so. And here's just kind of an overlay of uh, my experience with it and my thoughts on how uh, it might be changing things faster than we anticipate. Nothing to disclose, unfortunately. So as an overview, we'll go over a quick introduction, then largely have this conversation be based around different cases. And they're somewhat grouped into overarching themes, open and MIS deformity using the robot, single position surgery, and then uh, the benefits of the preoperative planning and analytics that comes tied in with the use of uh, the robot and its associated technologies. So to be clear, this is not a talk where I'm going to go into the literature describing how the robot has been shown to be extremely accurate or that it has very, very few, less than 1% general pedicle breaches or issues uh, related to navigation or even discussing about how it lowers the uh, barrier to entry for most surgeons as on the right we can see the pedicle screw placements of attending versus resident slash trainee and how they're statistically the same, both near 98% successful. Instead, this is more of a philosophical talk on the progression of our technology and how initially we do things manually. We place the screw, then we're somewhat powered, somewhat navigated, nav, fluoro, et cetera. And then finally, as we progress, we now have self-driving cars, which still require human input, still require a driver, but have taken on a good percentage of the workflow that is required to get from point A to point B. And ultimately, that is somewhat the goal of surgery, to get from point A to point B. And when I think of assistive devices, there's a clear sort of thought pattern in how they are for people who cannot do. They are for people who have issues or problems and are somewhat to put it in a, a different term, handicapped. They have an inability to walk. They need a seeing eye dog. Why would I want to incorporate that into my training? Why would I want to handicap myself or become reliant on a piece of technology which uh, may hinder my ability to do what others have trained for so long to do? And so we need to kind of rethink and refocus on what it is, on what uh, this piece of technology truly is. It is a means to put our thoughts and energy onto paper, in the computer, into the device, and then process it and have a specific type of output come out. So for example, here is a series of these types of arms putting together Tesla within the factory line. And we know that we have had great results with these types of arms and robotic input and output technology. Uh, in various different fields. They make our cars, they make our furniture, and so forth. And now we have one inside the OR. And so ultimately what we're trying to do is take the input, the preoperative scans, the physician's thoughts and knowledge on the way to improve uh, a patient's life, and then use the output that is navigated using this arm. Now, there are many ways to, to skin a cat. Pedicle screw placement is a fundamental tenant of spine surgery. You can do it navigation, fluoro, freehand. Uh, and all of them come with their pros and cons. With navigation, the OR spin time, the fear of bumping the frame, large body habit is creating an inaccurate nav situation. With fluoro, you're wearing heavy lead for hours, the possibility of large body habit is obscuring anatomy. And of course, with freehand, uh, requires more focus and attention as you're somewhat to uh, borrow the term off autopilot. You're off cruise control. You're driving the manual car. And then there's the more uncommon or higher risk trajectories, cervical pedicle screws, S2AI screws, which um, require a constant refresher to ensure that you remain um, facile in. But the thing that kind of ties all of these together is there is a very strong element of intraoperative analysis. You come into the OR, you do your exposure, you set up your fluoro, you identify the anatomy, and then you do. You do the surgery and you move things forward in that way. 
as I mentioned earlier, the pedicle screw is the foundation of our constructs. It is the rebar, to use another analogy, within the building. And if we don't have it, the cement, although it's strong, will crack and crumble on its own. But if we take a step back and we think about the true goals of the surgery, and we view ourselves more as architects, as designers, we can focus on the more uh, intensive, the more uh, important parts of the surgery to truly form, to truly achieve uh, correction and an ultimate final construct that we are happy with radiographically as well as clinically. And that is what this robot allows us to do because preoperative planning is a requirement when using the robot. And of course, every surgeon reviews the images, the MRI, the CT, the x-rays in clinic the night before, they dream about it, they know exactly what they're going to do in their mind's eye, they review it again, potentially interop. But the difference here is to continue using the building analogy, you're bringing the blueprints with you. You put this, your ideas down on paper, and then you're sterilely able to bring them into the OR. And then you, as the, the foreman, has a team, this group of people, which is consolidated down into the robot, to enact your plan exactly as you predicted 99 times out of 100. There is this true process and a record of your thought and intent, and it is incorporated. So before you even go into the OR, your team, meaning your thoughts on paper, already know where the entry points are going to be exactly. They know the trajectories, the screw length, diameter, projected osteotomy and interbody correction, and that minimizes on the fly troubleshooting. Many times I've been there, we've exposed, and we're just kind of shocked at the size of the fusion mass obscuring the anatomy or the amount of scar tissue from previous instrumentation, which just really makes things difficult to identify. This is already incorporated and um, acknowledged by you and your team. So moving on to cases. First off, we'll begin just with some open and MIS cases, single position surgery, and then finally predictive analytics. So to begin, this is a 64 male prior Harrington rod with flat back syndrome. Ultimately, we did a T4 to ilium, posterior effusion. We can see here, SVA of 10, lumbar lotus is a 14, his previous rod, very obvious there. So in order to proceed with the surgery, we know this can't be very small. This is gonna be a large procedure, beginning all the way up to T4 and going down to the pelvis. And so the days before we map out our plan, we get things ready and we get into the OR. And at this point, this is a complex enough surgery as it is. The least point of concern in our mind is the placement of the pedicle screws. We can instead focus on releasing the Harrington rods from the fusion mass. We can focus on doing the osteotomies and the correction to get this man standing upright and onto a better quality of life. We are able to move on with the surgery with full knowledge that our thoughts and efforts earlier in the week in planning this will come to fruition. And just as we predicted, the overlays are near identical to what is actually performed. And we can see that the screws are placed extremely well, no cortical breaches, no repositioning, and we're able to move on, perform the interbody, and get the results that we desired, improving his SVA. A second case, a T9 to ilium, this one MIS, performing a multi-rod fusion. 75 male, medically ill, you know, very hard to get him pre-optimized for a large surgery, which this is for this gentleman. Degenerative scoliosis, prior L5-S1 instrumentation. We can appreciate the dextroscoliosis with a 51 convexity, his previous instrumentation with a fractional uh, angle as well. SVA of 10.4. We know we wanted to do a small surgery on him to minimize blood loss, but we needed to balance that with achieving the goals of surgery. And so using the preoperative software, we plan for various inner bodies. We plan for the SPOs, accounting for uh, a conservative 6% per uh, level of uh, osteotomy and even incorporating the inner bodies into the plan. We then bring them into the OR and we bring in these plans with us. In conjunction, we plan out our screw heads, our rods. We know what we're going to expect and we have 
a team ready to give us exactly what we need to achieve our results. Finally here, this last image, you can see the four inner bodies also being navigated and assisted in terms of getting to where we need to be. This can all be done without the robot. There's no need, this is not groundbreaking on its own, but what's fantastic about this is that we do not need to be concerned about knowing that we're at the right level based off of fluoro, based off of an O-arm spin. We know that we are at the correct level without having to do any of those things aside from the initial registration. And so we have our 3D models. We do a superficial incision to minimize blood loss, place as many of the screws as we can, the forest of towers, as we like to call it, just perk screws everywhere. And of course, everything guided in real time screw placement. And we know exactly where we are as it's occurring. Finally, because we want to perform those PCOs, we're able to identify the appropriate levels and perform a very small, many open PCO, a minimally invasive osteotomy, simply to get this individual through the operating room as quickly as it can while still giving him the surgery that he deserves. And finally, we achieve our results. And just as we would have predicted, the curve near matches the predictive software analytics. And I also want you to take a note of the superior screws and how these ones are passing through the disk space and getting that tricortical purchase. If I had performed or placed this screw with a free handing attending, uh, I would have been lambasted. You know, I would have been told, okay, well, after the arm spin, that's clearly not right. We need to um, reposition them. Let's get to work. But now we have the ability to incorporate these types of screws. Yes, they're controversial, and some may view this as the wrong type of screw for this type of procedure, but at least it expands our armamentarium. It gives us the ability to do things that otherwise we might have completely tried to avoid because we know that we can do them safely. We know that we can reproduce them 99, 98% of the time. And it just gives us more tools to achieve what we ultimately want to do, getting from point A to point B. And of course, there's the benefit of minimal blood loss, EBL of 200, no transfusion, telemedicine, home on day four. Moving on to the second portion uh, of these cases, the, the goal or the benefits of single position surgery, which can be performed in the OLIF capacity, XLIF, and PTP. So the current practice, as we know, is the incision, incision and exposure of all disc places, the placement of the inner body cage and closure. The patient is then generally flipped and repositioned to a prone. And then there's the reincision and placement of all pedicle screws with fluoro, nav, freehand, however it may be, the rod placement and the final tightening of the screws. However, by bringing the blueprints in to the OR, along with a navigated arm, we can shift the activities and make them simultaneous. So there's an anterior surgeon and a posterior surgeon. For the example I'm using, uh, we'll be describing a, a lateral or an O-lift procedure, but this can also be done in a PTP manner. The anterior surgeon and posterior surgeon working simultaneously. The anterior surgeon is getting access, placing all the inner body cages. Meanwhile, the posterior surgeon is able to place all the pedicle screws with robotic guidance. Once the cages are placed, then the rod placement is positioned and there's a final tightening of the screws, and then they're closed. Such as an example here, this is Dr. Pham and myself performing an OLIF with a posterior fusion. And as you can see, he is preparing the disk space as it stands. Meanwhile, I am placing, I believe this is L4 to S2 AIs. The use of this with the OLIF uh, has been so relatively novel, we've even published a few articles regarding this simultaneous robotic single position OLIF fusion extending all the way down to the pelvis, even performing facetectomies. And so as an example here, an L35 single position OLIF with S2 to pelvis posterior fusion, uh, multi-level lumbar spondylitis with radiculopathy. So generally a flat back, significant radicular pain, as well as uh, overgrown facets and osteophytes. First step, in all of these procedures, we go to the planning stage. We think about what we can do to get this patient where they need to be. And we're able to plan our inner bodies. We're able to plan our screw trajectories and ensure that we are getting 
the best type of bony fixation possible while maintaining the appropriate alignment of the screw heads. We view this in 3D, and ultimately we position the patient. He has a fairly large body habit, but as he's in this position, we can move the adipose tissue out of the way with the assistance of gravity. Position them like so. We mark out the PSIS for our navigation, and then we're both getting to work. He's achieving access on the right, anteriorly, anterior to pro, anterior to psoas. Meanwhile, I here I clearly have the uh, the large navigated knife, which is used to perform the fascial incision prior to the placement of the screws and the or the drill and the screws. The forest of towers once again. The placement of the S2 AI screws, and because the patient's in the lateral position, brought all the way to the edge of the bed, there's plenty of room for the drill to be able to achieve what is needed to be done. Beyond the placement of the screws, we've been able to use the robot to ensure that we are performing our inner bodies at the correct level and even navigate the placement and the uh, preparation of the disk space intraoperatively. And finally, we achieve the result that we had planned for. We're able to, using the robot navigate to the osteophyte, ensure that it's open, and get a great placement of the OLEV cage. The final section I was hoping to um, speak about are the, the value of predictive analytics. So this is a, a T6 to ilium posterior fusion with uh, a prior T10 to ilium and implant failure. So unfortunately, this woman underwent a fairly large spinal surgery uh, earlier in her life, which subsequently failed. We can see the fractured screws. We can see the abandoned screws up here and fractured hardware. This has continued to generate, leading to an SVA of 9.4 and a PT of 37. And so the question is, what are we going to do to get this patient from point A to point B? Well, by using the robotic software, we're able to plan out exactly what types of inner bodies and osteotomies we are able to do. And because of machine learning, because the technology has been exposed to hundreds and thousands of different robotic plans, we know that there is more that we can gain from simply beyond simply having a plan and bringing into the OR. We now can able, are able to predict what type of rod are we going to have? What is the curvature of the rod? And so by using this technology and incorporating it with a separate company, we are now able to pre-print and bring in our own rods that have been pre-bent, suited exactly for the plan and the patient's proposed curve. Metcria is the company that we use, but this is something that can really only be done by taking the energy the introp energy of the placement and the alignment of the screws and putting it on paper and bringing it to your team of people who have had much experience with this type of technology and then create something that is custom made for your patient. No more at the end of the case after performing four hours of screw placements, osteotomy, corrections, etc. Do you have to focus on the rod and think about getting it to exactly where you need to be? You've automated a part of the surgery, allowing you to focus on the more important parts of the design, allowing you to do the osteotomies and get the patient where they need to be. Here we can see the appropriate correction. From a 9.6 4.7 and an improvement of their pelvic tilt as well. And as we predicted using the osteotomy and interbody software, the rod was able to match the specifications exactly as we hoped that it would. Um, and so we were able to focus on the removal of whichever abandoned screw heads we had the uh, incorporation of the previous screws that were still viable, working through the fusion mass and able to get the patient where they needed to be while saving our cognitive energy for the larger procedure, 
as we've automated a portion of the entire procedure itself. T9 to ilium. Oh, Degenerative scoliosis. Here, 60s male. With levoscoliosis, 60 degrees in the convex. Uh, SVA of two, extremely flat back. Looking at the CT, we can appreciate the significant lateral esthesis, vacuum disc phenomena, and a fractional angle. This is confirmed on the MRI. And so, again, we bring them to the preoperative planning stage. And we can see that we can map out our current preoperative angles and then plan out, forgive me, plan out following the osteotomies and the placement of an inner body. The goal of improving this patient's lumbar lotus is a five to a much more reasonable 36. We incorporate the robot and we're able to achieve an angle of 38 extraordinarily close to our predicted angle. And that's one of the values of putting all of these patients into what is essentially a large database. This is no longer an individual surgeon's experience within their own mind as they've seen hundreds and thousands of different procedures and screws and angles of the spine that they have now become masters. We are able to bring in the experience of thousands of people and hundreds of thousands of patients over time so that we can accurately predict what different osteotomies will perform on average. And then we can use this machine learning to move forward and know what type of rods we're going to need based off of the internal rotation of the spine. No longer will there be a surprise of, oh, this screw head is far off to the left. How am I going to incorporate this rod here? No more well, less intraoperative responsiveness or uh, on the fly thinking of how to solve a problem that was not expected because we brought in the blueprints, we brought in the idea, the energy that we would have spent in the OR problem solving, making sure everything is perfect, has been moved to the pre-op environment. And so we can get from point A to point B and simply move on with the surgery. We don't need to expend the cognitive energy in its placement. And as I was kind of referring to earlier, the use of machine learning and predictive analytics, the goal is to have a very large database and know the expected outcomes based off of what has been seen, but also to predict what would be the right type of procedure for an individual patient. And so we're able to send our pre-op images and then get back various plans that are supervised and looked over by the individuals within the company, but also, of course, by the surgeon. And the surgeon has these proposed ideas on proposed ways on how to get the patient to where they need to be. And then they're able to agree with or completely get rid of the various ideas. And as we add more patients to this large database, it only becomes more clear that the preoperative planning is something that we can be better at. And it's something that by bringing together the experience of hundreds and different surgeons, can we come up with ideas that we may not have initially thought of because we are now able to focus on the bigger picture. And so really to conclude, it's an old adage of one of my uh, mentors, Dr. Pham, that old ways will not open new doors. And while the screw, the pedicle screw placement is a fundamental, fundamental technique that every spine surgeon should be completely comfortable of in whatever technique they need to do it. Freehand, ideally, the use of fluoro, the use of navigation it is a core tenant of the procedures that we perform. And so we can do it with our nav, we can do it with our fluoro, or by identifying our landmarks and proceeding as such. But if we're able to incorporate or give up a portion and allow it to be automated, well, to put it like this, there are textbooks that have chapters and chapters dedicated to the opening and closure of a wound. This is a very, very simple idea that everything we do 
has a universe of potential knowledge to be gained from it. We could explore every facet of everything we do and just continue to dive deeper and deeper and deeper and learn more and more and more. But if we're able to take a step back and see a bigger picture, we can understand that there are many other things which we also need to explore. And by allowing a portion of it to be automated by us having put our energy from the OR into the preoperative planning, we can then focus on these other things, these techniques which will actually allow us to correct the deformity rather than simply be the foundation for the building that we're making. In another metaphor, we can do amazing things by calculating out the math by hand, by putting a pen to paper, and we can create wonders of the world. But at the same time, if we allow a portion of that to be automated, well, things that we would have thought impossible even a few years ago now become reality. This is the, the SpaceX self-landing rocket reaching near orbit levels and then coming back down to Earth and landing perfectly, a reusable rocket. Similarly, what we've discussed is only what's really available right now with the robot. And we know that more things are on the horizon. Guided MIS laminectomies. MIS osteotomies and facetectomies, dialed compression and distraction with pressure reading outputs, and of course, continued machine learning of the construct and its uh, design. And so ultimately, I hope that this talk was able to kind of explain one perspective on a relatively controversial uh, technology, but the goal really is to invite the discussion that this is more than just another assistive tool. This is more than a fancy drill or a, a new MIS tube. Um, this is truly a technology which will uh, shift the paradigm of what is possible. And uh, for that, I uh, thank you for your time, for everyone who was able to uh, hang on, and uh, I invite and open any questions. Hey, but it's Hanny. That, that was, you know, I've heard a lot of robotics talks. That was probably the best one or maybe one of the better ones. And I think part of it is that it's coming from somebody in your position. I think it's actually really helpful to hear it um, from somebody who's sort of going through training and see it through their eyes and see how it's helpful. Um, so, so that was great. I think you touched on a, a ton of really good points. There's one comment I, I feel compelled to make, and I don't want to beat a dead horse because I've said it a lot before, but I guess of everything that you discussed, what what percentage of that actually falls under sort of the umbrella of traditional robotics? And what I, what I mean by that, sorry, maybe that's over yeah. my thinking, but what I mean by that is really what we're talking about is, is rigid stereotaxy, right? Yeah. Just like a, a drill guide that, that finds the pedicle screws. So... That, I think, is, you can argue that the benefit and the, the economics of it, but so much of what you discuss, like having a plan, machine learning, being able to reduce the cognitive load, find the correct levels, it's essentially, it's navigation. It's navigation and it's um, procedural planning and software. And so, I, I don't know if why for me it strikes a core, but I feel like we, we too often conflate robotics <laughs> you know, with, with all those different sort of software applications where right now, like our robot, the actual robot is super crude. It's just a stereotactic arm, which we've had for a really long time. And I think it's important, but I just feel like it's, it would be nice if we could kind of change the vocabulary around it as it might compel our industry partners to maybe spend more time thinking about those, you know, next gen type applications like laminotomy or, or um, fastectomy or, or osteotomy, the things that are more difficult to achieve as opposed to medical screw placement. Because if you've been using navigation for a really long time, and there are very few benefits, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I agree. I think, I think you start coupling on those enabling technologies. I agree. The vocabulary could really be defined more clearly. But the way I see it is this rigid serotaxy is incorporated and is a part of the robot. And unlike navigation, it is just one part of the output that we're able to uh, use the robot for. And so by incorporating it and then ultimately making it better, um, or at least more uh, ergonomic and accessible for surgeons and trainees to 
be able to use, it uh, carries its own benefits. But your comments are well appreciated, and I understand exactly what you're trying to say. So, uh, yeah, I, I echo Hanny's thought. It was a great, very great. It was a really good talk and really, and really thoughtful. So uh, thank you so much for doing it and putting that together. Hey, so like, you know, one of the things, you know, um, you know, that's, that's going to be a challenge is that the, the knowledge and technology gap that's being created is pretty big. So, you know, there's spine surgery happening all over the country and thousands and thousands and thousands of hospitals, yes. let alone spine surgery that's being ha that's happening overseas and other developed countries, but then other underdeveloped countries. And so the the speed at which we're changing and making things better is at a far greater pace than the rest of the world, um, which is going to create a gap. Um, it's going to create an education gap and um, a huge technology gap. And because of the cost of this, that gap is going to persist over time. It's not going to get better quickly. Mm -hmm. So just just food for thought or comments from you on like, you know, if training in 10 years is, is robot slash, um, you know, navigation dependent, um, you know, where where do we see ourselves going? Like, yeah, do you I, see that being a problem? I I do. I can see it being a problem in certain areas. I think it's very clear that a fundamental knowledge of the anatomy is extraordinarily important. But uh, to kind of bring it to a facet within neurosurgery, there is a procedure that was once performed before um, CT and MRI. It's called a cisternogram. Um, and they're able to essentially place air within the ventricles. And then, yes, neurosurgery analogies, I love it. <laughs> and so because we didn't have knowledge of, or we didn't have the access for more advanced imaging, every single resident training attending had to know intricately the placement of the vessels and whether the anterior arteries were displaced in a circular motion, meaning that there was a curve, or if they were displaced in an acute angle, meaning there's one of a square that gave them information as to where the lesion, the tumor, the blood, whatever it was, is. That is something that is largely not done. And we can say that that is a loss in the understanding of the anatomy. But instead, we still know our anatomy very well. We just access it from a different viewpoint. Now, bringing it back to the pedicle screw, I think that every trainee should have at some point the experience of having an experienced teacher freehanding them, teaching them how to freehand and doing it within the cadaver, within the patient. But as the robot and fluoro and nav and all these technologies which have already disrupted us uh, continues to move us away from the intricate fine details of anatomy that our, our forefathers uh, were able to dedicate 100% of their cognitive energy on. Well, we just need to be mindful of that, and we can't allow it to uh, run away from us to the point where, God forbid, we're, gadu we're graduating someone who, uh, you know, has only done MIS placement of screws, or has only placed screws using fluoro, or only used navigation. And so this gap is something that we need to keep talking about, and uh, it's not just the naysayers poo-pooing the new technology. It is a true, true issue that uh, we can fix and we can be mindful of while incorporating this new technology. And I guess eventually CT scans got cheap enough that they had them in the developing world as well. Yeah, I mean, every time I present at our own spine conference, some of our attendees are, where are the upright films? Well, trauma doesn't really do upright films anymore for these fractures. They get the CT and then uh, we proceed from there. And it's kind of shocking to see these things evolve in my training and lifetime. Uh, ultimately, things are just going to go faster. Uh, we're going to see further adoption of this, and uh, it's going to change the way that we think about it. I, I will say, like, one thing I love mm -hmm. that this technology is doing is it's, is it's forcing folks to be more thoughtful about their plans. And 
I think that's a huge benefit to um, these types of technologies that require a plan um, because it really does force you to sit down, think about what you're going to do, what you're trying to achieve, you know, what your alignment goals will be. Absolutely. And I think that will be, I think that is, uh, I think one of the really, really good benefits that's happening is that it's really forcing, forcing people um, in the community to, to be more thoughtful. Yeah, to echo that, the common fear I hear is that this is going to lower the barrier of entry so much that although board certified spine surgeons, uh, that people who maybe have no business doing these types of procedures due to their lack of dedicated study, focus, and training will now be able to do these, you know, T4 to pelvis procedures. But by having this database and by being forced to really communicate your goals to you know the various companies and then comparing it to what other people may have done it ultimately makes a safer surgeon someone who if they decide to undertake this type of procedure now has checkpoints and balances that will as you said make them more mindful and kind of realize that oh you know maybe this VCR is not what the patient needs. And instead we should do multi-level PCOs or uh, perhaps extending it further or making it shorter, et cetera. And so it's, it's, a, it's a double-edged sword. You know, more people will be able to do extraordinarily complex things. But as I think everyone on this call understands, the actual manual construction is not the ultimate goal of the surgery. It is the thoughtfulness and the knowledge that we're doing the right type of procedure for this patient. Well said, brother. Yeah, there's, there's still big surgeries. I still think people just, some people just don't like to do them. I think that's yeah. the bottom line. They'll, it may encourage people to do one or two of them, but ultimately it's still, these are hard operations. And if you don't do them often, uh, then you're, you're not gonna be as happy with your outcome. Line, you know? Yeah, I agree. High, high, volume, high volume for sure is a, is a benefit to the complex. So I'm not too worried about that. And hopefully, like you said, if they do try to tackle it, that you know there's thoughtfulness that goes into it, and that the, you know, like some of the revision cases you showed. Hopefully, they don't end up like the way they started for in your guys' scene. So yeah. Well, thanks, Dr. Hey, Gibbs. Danny. That's one closing question. comment. Yeah, please. Hey, Danny, just one closing comment. I think there's an element of failing forward to all of this. And I think no matter when it started out with the um, early deformity cases, all the various iterations that we've done throughout the years, there is that part of it. And I really kind of applaud, you know, you and Dr. Pham and the others who are taking that leap uh, to sort of incorporate these new technologies. <clears throat> um, and I think it's fantastic sort of the melding of, you know, the robotic and the planning and have, forcing people to take the time to think about trajectories, think about screw lengths, and now incorporating that with Metacorea and actually using predictive analytics and sort of considering the outcomes. So I think this is taking us all in a really good direction. Um, and again, I'm, I'm really appreciative of the, those of you that are putting forth this effort to uh, lead the path for us. Yeah, I feel very fortunate to be in this uh, kind of environment. I'm excited to see how things continue to progress. And uh, I appreciate all of your times and everyone who's uh, managed to make it to the end. So I hope you all have a, a great day. Thanks, Danny. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.